Welcome back to our forum at NIA's virtual studio. And our next presentation is GovTech for Disaster Risk Management. The presentation will set out the key foundations of GovTech that are essential for COVID-19 response and recovery and a number of key principles to ensure that GovTech can actually support and enable how societies and economies can recover from COVID-19 and other disasters. This particular presentation is co-hosted by UNDP and Tamasai University. Joining us is our keynote speaker, Mr. Callum Hanford, advisor, digitalization and smart cities of UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation and Sustainable Development. And the session is moderated by Assistant Professor Dr. Tawida Kamunwe, the Dean of Faculty of Political Science, Tamasai University, who is also a disaster risk management expert. So let's hear from them. Good evening, everyone. From the last session about the energy and UNDP, we are going to move to another session and bringing you to the world of disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction. It doesn't matter you're talking about earthquake, you're talking about flood, tsunami, or even a COVID-19 as we know now for the past half a year. I'm going to take you to the world of how we deal with the risk reduction. Today, I am your moderator, or basically, I'm the one who talked to our expert today. I am Tawida Agamonwet, the Dean of School of Political Science, Thomasat University. And with me today is an expert from the United Nation Development Program. He is an advisor in digitalization and smart city at the Global Center of Innovation. So he will be the one who talked with us today about how he thinks of the disaster risk and how he bring about the innovation and all digitalization to help reduce risk to the community. And basically, we are looking at the goal of being resilient. So are you ready? Callum Hanford? If I'm you're ready, ready you, let's start with so, your presentation you, you, and your talk. Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you, Tavida. So um, UNDP, we work with a number of governments around the world. Uh, and we see that governments and GovTech as well play a really key role in improving people's lives and livelihoods in many, many countries around the world. And when we talk about GovTech, um, what we're talking about here is it's about technology to improve how public services function, but also using technology and innovation to improve how they're providing public services, but also engaging citizens as well. Tavida, you made a really exciting point in the introduction there, um, and something I think we can pick up in the discussion in a moment. But it's really important to think about actually what is a disaster. Um, in many countries, the past few decades, we've focused on very physical um, uh, understandings of what a disaster is. So things like hurricanes, uh, floods, and so on. But, and that's often driven us towards looking at uh, resilience and technology. So things like sensors and so on. But actually, we're now in the context of COVID-19, looking at a much broader and all encompassing definition of a disaster. So something that affects the society and the economy um, and affects people's lives um, in, in, in every walk of life. And this also broadens the role of actually what GovTech uh, looks like in a disaster context as well, which is something that I'm going to walk through over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Also, having spent a little bit of time in government um, several years ago, um, often external factors such as disasters are what drive change in a government environment. Um, interestingly, the, the CEO of Microsoft mentioned a few months ago that COVID-19 has driven two years of digital transformation in a matter of months. And that's definitely what we're seeing in many, many governments that we're working with around the world too. Importantly though, we also need to recognize the limits and the limitations of technology, particularly in governments and particularly in public service delivery. Technology and innovation are not a panacea. Um, they cannot fix everything uh, and nor should they either. What they are, though, is a tool in a toolkit or in a number of toolkits, depending on the disaster. And they're there to complement or augment or amplify offline and human and other processes. So interestingly, Singapore, um, where the UNDP Global Center is based, was one of the first governments to explore using applications, mobile apps, to, to do contact tracing in the context of COVID. So using Bluetooth and similar technologies. The quote that I've put up on the screen there is actually a very public quote from one of the lead developers there, highlighting that such an amazing tool um, should not be replacing offline and public health processes. And I think this is a really exciting uh, way to think about actually GovTech more broadly. It is not meant to solve every solution, every issue. It is not meant to be a panacea. It's meant to augment and complement existing processes, which sometimes I think we can forget about. 
What we've also seen in the context of COVID-19 and other disasters um, is the importance of digital foundations, strong digital foundations. So the countries that have responded quickly and successfully to COVID um, often had very strong digital foundations. And those that are starting to take tentative and promising steps into a recovery phase also have very strong digital foundations as well. So in our global work at UNDP, working with governments and their partners around digitalization, technology and innovation, we've identified seven key foundations that drive uh, uh, public service delivery um, in, a, in a disaster or other context. I'm not gonna walk through all seven here, and um, we can pick them up in the discussion, but there are two that I'd particularly like to highlight um, before I go into the rest of the presentation. The first one is infrastructure and connectivity. And this includes things like wired and wireless connectivity. So fiber broadband, 4G, maybe even 5G one day as well. This is a very complicated policy area, it includes things like the private sector, includes landowners. It's about tackling inequality, ensuring you have coverage across an entire country. Um, but it's a really fundamental aspect of delivering public services and GovTech across the country as well. Particularly in a disaster, it's about things like pop-up networks to provide critical communications. But longer term as well, it's also critical for delivering things like telemedicine, remote working, remote education, and so on. The second one I'd like to highlight is authentication and identification. So often things like digital ID or identity more broadly. Um, around the world, we've got more than 1 billion people have no formal government identification. Without that identification, they're cut off from the economy, they're cut off from society, they cannot play a meaningful role in their country or in their economy. This is problematic in itself, but when you're looking to, to do disaster response, you're often tackling the most marginalized populations and you need to be getting them the support that they need when they need it. If they're completely off the grid and they have no ID and they're not recognized, then that support is impossible. And it means that you can't provide the, the immediate support you need or support in, in recovery either. So as I mentioned, we can pick up the others in the, in the discussion, um, but we see all seven of these as being particularly important. And we're seeing many governments, particularly in the context of COVID recovery, exploring many of these at pace. I should also mention that these are not necessarily a kind of linear pathway and governments don't have to be doing them all uh, in one go or sequentially, but they all play an important role. Um, and we were really kind of working with a number of governments to try and implement these in, in many difficult, difficult and different settings. I'd also just like to walk through a few wider principles before we go into the discussion. The first one is focusing on inequality. So often disasters and technology um, impact societies and economies and individuals uh, in very different ways. And they're not always in equal ways either. Um, for example, when we talk about technology, um, again, in the context of COVID, we're talking a lot about things like remote learning. Um, but unfortunately, not every population or every community in a country has equal access or equal benefit to things like remote learning. So often the most marginalized do not have access to devices to learn with, they do not have access to connectivity to access the internet, or in a more fundamental way, they don't have safe spaces or time away from work to actually learn and benefit from the benefits of things like remote um, learning. Similarly, when we talk about uh, remote working, uh, often this is still a privilege for a privileged few, so more white collar jobs and so on. And then we look at things like the gig economy, which is often the kind of foundation of the digital economy. Um, these are still focused on very precarious, low end jobs with few rights um, and few benefits as well. So just highlighting that technology um, and its responses are not always equal. On a related point as well, we also need to be understanding the needs and realities of citizens in our countries in order to make technology, both in disaster times and in more normal times, relevant and useful. This is actually something we've been doing a lot of with our country offices around the world, um, including commissioning a recent uh, video series, which is available on our website, focusing on design thinking, which is a really fundamental process about understanding how people uh, engage with technology, but also understand their fundamental needs and what technology can do to improve them. I'd just like to walk through one example of a solution I worked on a little while ago. So this was a, a chatbot that provided uh, health information for, for adolescent girls who often had no uh, safe or trusted source of information. Uh, so a really important role of, of kind of uh, technology in, in providing an essential public service. We piloted this across uh, 2,000 uh, users across five countries. And that massive circle you see on the, on the right-hand side there is actually the, the different journeys that these, these girls took. 
So across 2,000 users, we had more than 1,500 unique user journeys. And that really highlighted the importance of actually understanding what these girls wanted from their technology, the information that they needed, and really understand their needs and realities in order to provide the service that they wanted. Uh, Tavita mentioned in the, in the introduction the, the kind of role of data, um, and this is something that we see particularly important. Um, and I mentioned earlier things like open data are, are particularly useful, but just two concepts to talk about here in the context of disaster um, management and, and risk and resilience and, and so on. The first is big data. Um, we often hear this in the context of disasters, so things like sensors, mobile data, geospatial data it has a very important role to play but it's quite a complex thing to set up and not all countries are positioned to do it from day one. The second is what we call lean data. Uh, and this is a more agile way of, of tracking progress um, over time, but it's also about providing voices to the voiceless. So asking the questions that matter most to populations and then collecting the data that matters most to policymakers as well. However, when we talk about big data and lean data and open data as well, one thing we often forget about is uh, data collection and the fundamentals of actually how we get meaningful and useful data on our populations. Um, if, you, if you're not, essentially this is really important because if you're not counted, you don't count. And particularly if you're trying to do policy or disaster response, it's essential that you're understanding uh, your population, where they are, what they need, um, and so on. So UNDP, what we have launched in the context of COVID is a, a global program focused on digital socioeconomic impact assessments. And what we've done here, and you can see on the screen, is build an entire end-to-end -end workflow to support our country offices and their partner governments in collecting data to actually inform meaningful policy um, and other responses. So we've built uh, the training needed behind this. We've built that whole digital workflow, um, the systems, the support unit, and so on. And to date, we've conducted over, um, I think, nearly uh, 60 household and small and medium enterprise ass um, assessments. And all this data is then feeding into policymakers to allow them to, to build uh, the policies, solutions, and initiatives to support in the context of a disaster like COVID. Finally, I'd just like to highlight the importance of not duplicating um, or repeating um, efforts that have already happened. So the importance of essentially building on success. Open source, um, we find, is a particularly important concept, particularly in the context of, of GovTech. So the Global Center, we've had a very big focus on open source this year. So one effort we had on, on the left-hand side there is our, our COVID-19 Detect and Protect Challenge. And this is working with companies like Intel, Microsoft, Google, and many, many others to uh, essentially crowdsource hardware open source innovation. And so we now have more than 350 uh, open source hardware solutions available on our website. Um, all freely available to download, so all the kind of code, the schematics, the design files for things like um, digital stethoscopes, uh, hands-free uh, sanitizer dispensers, but also very complex solutions like Internet of Things uh, devices to monitor the spread of, of COVID in the society. And again, these are all freely available for any country or government to start implementing today. The second, which I'd just like to focus on before wrapping up, is our COVID-19 open source digital toolkit. So as part of this, we've collated uh, more than 25 open source digital tools. Um, and these are tools that have been proven in other settings. So for example, the Ebola response um, from a few years ago, or in wider GovTech or digital transformation settings as well. And this includes everything from um, the digital tools needed to build uh, a testing system for COVID through to digital tools that can drive freedom, freedom of information or crowdsourcing platforms or other tools or initiatives for government. Overall, the tools represent more than 100 million US dollars worth of uh, development time. But most importantly for countries, they allow governments to, to start not from scratch. So to accelerate their response and to learn from what's working and the challenges and the opportunities in hundreds of other countries around the world that have applied these tools successfully. We had one particularly exciting uh, use case quite recently with this, where a government, um, one of our partner governments, uh, was looking to build a a laboratory uh, system to, to track COVID testing. Um, they were looking at going out to the private sector for this, um, which would have taken some time. It would have been expensive and likely would have been proprietary. So they'd been stuck with, with one solution. Uh, they found our toolkit. They found an interesting solution on there built by a university. We brokered a partnership with, uh, with the university and now this government has built this entire tool across their country, uh, saved several millions of dollars and significantly accelerated their response to COVID. 
So again, the importance of building on success um, and what's already worked and what's working um, is really, really important in the context of disaster management. So thank you again for your time. Uh, I appreciate I've covered quite a bit here, but very keen to, to move into the discussion um, and move into picking up some of the questions as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Callum, for your talk and presentation and such a time control. So it's left me with a lot of questions and then we can talk, but which is really like, I'm happier than keep listening. So just a quick question to uh, ice breaking, what we're talking today, to you in your personal view. On top of your head, if I ask you, how much difficult COVID-19 comparing to the other disaster you ever actually work with? So it's a really, really good really question. Good question. Um, um, so I think in, I think in my personal my experience, personal experience it's, it's incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Historically, as, as I mentioned in the outset, a lot of disasters tend to be quite time, time limited or very specific. So a hurricane or similar um, is going to be focusing on a particular geographic part of the society or a particular sector of the economy or, or similar. What we're seeing with COVID is actually it is completely uh, all encompassing. So affecting every aspect of our economies and societies. And that in turn requires a, a cross government and also a cross society response. So the complexity is much, much higher. Um, and similarly as well, no country yet has the answer to COVID-19. So trying to figure out a way out with no, with no guidance is, is very, very complicated as well. So we're seeing it as a particularly complex and unprecedented challenge. Okay, um, the, the reason that I asked you because I myself is teaching disaster risk management and I really found this COVID kind of like inverse, um, reverse and just perhaps taking me to somewhere else. Because usually when we're dealing with disaster, we are talking about large scale, we are talking about expansion, we are talking about transnationalization, cross function and everything across border even. And then suddenly, COVID-19 has crossed border to us. And then suddenly the management that we've been known of as a um, integration, cooperation, collaboration turned to be shut down because each of the province, each of the states, each of the community would love to perhaps shut themselves in and not welcoming even assistance or anything else so that they can preserve the peaceful moment of not being contagious. So this is why I ask. It's in, in terms of a person who teach, I feel like, whoa, I need another kind of body of knowledge. So when we talk about body of knowledge, let me grab from the last uh, sentence that you summarized a moment ago, and then we go backward into your presentation. You're talking about uh, partnership between public, private, and then university as an academic sector. And because of making that kind of collaboration and relationship, it's, uh, university has a lot of research, basically, as a research base, and we've been known of. Singapore is a country that actually having a national policy based on research. But then you're talking about a lot of developing countries that have not make a research-based policy. So my question to you is, how would we can actually enhance a capability and then support between government, university, and private sector to be like to more concrete ways so that we can have a research base in place and perhaps quick win in anything that actually in a time limit happen and then we can just perhaps use it, choose it out. Definitely, it's, it's a very, it's a very important challenge um, and one that many countries I think are facing. Um, so from my experience, what I think is particularly relevant is highlighting the value of research. So obviously there is very much a role for abstract and blue sky research, but also for many countries as well, it's about making research applied and linked to your, your national development priorities as well as a country. So the role that academics, uh, academia more broadly, can play in driving a country forward. Um, Singapore is a country that's done that very well. It's got a very strong, as you mentioned, uh, research agenda. And I think many other countries around the world as well, places like Rwanda and elsewhere, uh, I really understand the kind of value of, of research. But I think for, for many, it's about working with policymakers and, and politicians to highlight actually the importance of research, the importance of research investment, but also to some extent a kind of culture change as well and highlighting what it actually means to do research. You're not going to get a quick win necessarily, but you are going to be investing for a potential bigger win down the line as well. 
Um, for many people outside of academia and outside of research and um, more broadly, it's a very um, different world and, and it's often a, a very closed world. So also the more that the research and academics can be doing to, to uh, provide uh, insight into that world as well for policymakers, investors and others, um, I think is really important. You, I would love you to be um, a director of a research sponsor of my country <laughs> so you. that um, you no, know, because the thought of being able to fail being able to try an error is actually of course on one way is based on innovation kind of like emerging but the other way around that people usually say that we are perhaps uh, on the ivory tower and we don't see things as such. A lot of our research is actually up there on the shelf, not coming down and, and being practiced. But listening to you, it's, I like the word culture that you said, that perhaps we have to, to make people have a, a culture of we can try and then we can fail so that we can get a better solutions because there is no quick win. That, that's perhaps what I like the most. Then it, it dragged me to one thing, this is gonna come late, a critical question, not, not serious question. Do you think how much a policy maker listen to the researcher and professors maybe? Yeah, no, definitely. So having been in government, it's, um, it's sometimes tricky because obviously you're, you're driven by very political um, realities as well. Um, so sometimes evidence-based evidence policymaking isn't as evidence-based as it could be. Um, but again, it's, it's all about trying to build, as you mentioned, Tavita, that kind of collaboration between the private sector um, and researchers and the public sector as well to really understand the value um, of research. But it, it takes time. It, it is very much a cultural organizational journey for, for all of those sectors. Um, and I completely agree with your point, the importance of testing, learning, adapting, uh, being open to the concept of failure and um, being able to, to learn from mistakes. And I think that's particularly important in the context of, of data, as I mentioned as well. So running things like randomized control trials and others to actually understand what works, what doesn't, how you can uh, improve uh, and so on. Okay, so let me move back to a lot of details and content in your slide. One thing that struck me the most because you just, you mentioned it and you perhaps, because of the limit of time that we set up for you, so you didn't go much into the details. I want you to perhaps talk to me more about inequality. Let, let, let me tell you why, why I get to the inequality because you are talking a lot in terms of when we are trying to digitalize a lot of public service and digitalize a lot of government work or even digitalize a, a community condition of living. Okay, that, that being said, that technology would help us a lot. But then, on the other way around, technology also bring inequality. Because, come on, COVID-19 for the past semester, I almost gonna die talking to myself six hours a day in front of the monitor doing online course and it's really dry me up. Anyway, and a lot of students, a lot of community cannot have that access effectively and efficiently. So when you talk about focusing on infrastructure and those offline that perhaps can work together with the community that is most vulnerable, can you share a little more how we outwin inequality and then make digitalization happen, and then that digitalized society is not going to create another inequality. Completely, it's Sorry, just an incredibly important concept and, and something we're exploring a lot of at, at UNDP. So essentially, the, there's a, firstly a kind of baseline foundation, so ensuring that everyone has access to, to technology. So that includes things like connectivity, so wherever you are in a country, you, know, you have internet access and, and so on. And then comes with that though, is actually making that access um, accessible, so making it affordable. Um, often many countries' data is still too expensive for many people to, to have. Uh, making sure people have access to devices, which again, uh, many, particularly women and girls, don't. Um, and that access is, is a really fundamental issue um, because we see, particularly in the context of, of technology, that um, access is one thing, but ownership is also another factor. So if you have access to, for example, a mobile phone a few times a week as, as a woman or a girl often, um, you're only able to explore the very basics of that device. But if you own a device, it's actually yours. You can explore it at your leisure. You can build really solid skills with it. So it's important, I think, first, not to just focus on access, but the kind of wider piece around things like ownership and so on. But beyond that, um, there's a point you kind of picked up on there, Tavida, is um, the kind of wider 
um, ecosystem of, of technology um, around this as well. So it's fine being able to deliver things like remote education, but are people actually able to engage with it in a meaningful way? If you're in quite a marginalized population, even if you do have broadband access, uh, you may still be uh, stuck having to, to go to work instead of being able to go to school. Sometimes going to school in a, in a physical setting um, is the only way you could access education and carve that space out in your life to learn and to prosper. Um, now we've shifted digital, you may lose that time and you may lose that safety or, um, or solace as well. So I think really recognizing that actually there are benefits to going to digital in terms of providing access and making things more open and useful, but also the, the real challenges that we haven't really embraced either, that it can actually exacerbate or entrench this inequality um, as well. And actually we, we see this as quite a few studies coming out around remote learning and um, particularly in the States and so on. And we're seeing that more marginalized populations, particularly those from ethnic minority backgrounds, um, are being left further behind than their, their more privileged peers because they don't have the time, the space, or the access to, to technology to actually make the most of things like uh, online or digital learning. Okay, you're talking a lot about minority culture awareness. One thing, I, I used to be in one of the lecture. Um, he's the one who's going to run for somehow later if we have election in, in Thailand. He used to talk about a digitalization and smart city would outsmart people. The point is, a lot of vulnerable groups are the elders, let's make it that way. And the mm. elders, for some, because we have a, a really good medical treatment, so they don't die very easy. So we have a lot of aging society and the elders walking out there. And sometimes making a community too smart, making it too digitalized, it scares people off. So it's been a phrase, a new one. You, we usually talk smart city, uh, digitalization, and then this person, this professor bringing out the thought of just enough smart, enough smart community. It means that when you, when you create a smartness or a digitalization, you perhaps understand the people. I hear this word from your presentation too. Empathize a lot how, how digitalization and smart can blend into their um, lifestyle and, and, and perhaps familiarity so that they don't scare much. So is it somehow in your line of work you confront into technology scare people and, and how we deal with it? It's, it's a really good point. So um, personally, I, I'm not the biggest fan of the, of the term smart cities because it's very deterministic. It, it highlights the role of technology at the expense of everything. And the point I've mentioned in my presentation is that technology is not a panacea. It is a, a tool in, in a wider toolkit of, of improving people's lives and, and their livelihoods. We prefer to talk about future cities um, or when we talk about smart cities, we're very keen to stress it's about technology and innovation. And that innovation includes things like behavior change. It includes things like indigenous knowledge, nature-based solutions and so on, which are actually much more relevant to a society um, than just applying sensors or, or 4G or, or 5G or similarly. But regardless of, of what you're using in a city or in an urban environment or across a country, it should be really founded on the needs and realities of your citizens. So sometimes technology can play a role, sometimes it'll be a different solution. So regardless of what you're talking about, whether it's a smart city or a future city, it's all about actually understanding what your citizens need and then building solutions around that, which may require tech or it may require something else. Okay, since we, we talk a lot in terms of um, use, the use of technology and you also mentioned in terms of data as well. Uh, before, before I'm getting to a question about technical question in terms of data or how to solve a big data problem fragmented to something else, let, let me go with the human touch question first. When we talk about technology, when we talk about data, because, because basically digitalization and smart city based on data. But, you know, in a lot of the country, people don't have trust enough. This is a big word. This is like a magic word that um, we don't trust the government. The government don't trust us. We don't trust a company open source. We don't trust how we share information, what security and safety that we have. So how do we deal with with um, the trust and perception of being violated in terms of privacy and things else. What, what's the thought of it that we can perhaps make this um, data shared in terms of that? 
Definitely. So I think you mentioned uh, a really good point earlier in our discussion is about uh, the importance of, of broader partnerships, so regional, international, and so on. So really building international best practice about what is uh, trust and, and what is uh, acceptable and, and what is not acceptable in the context of, of uh, data and, and privacy more generally. And, and organizations like UNDP are really trying to, trying to, uh, to drive that kind of agenda as well. Um, I think beyond that, though, it's also trying to um, highlight to citizens the importance of this technology to, to build trust. It's, it's very much a journey um, with your citizens to highlight, you know, we're doing, we need this data to improve your lives in this way or, or that way or to deliver this service or to make this service better or faster or, or more efficient or, or so on. Um, but fundamentally as well, regardless of how good the services are, there has to be a, a culture of accountability and transparency as well. Um, you cannot just, um, and citizens will not accept, uh, governments uh, without any level of kind of accountability on how they're using data uh, and so on. And that also extends to the private sector. And um, so making sure they're really kind of meaningful controls and checks and balances on how the private sector, public sector, civil society and others are using uh, the data of, of the public and other data sources as well. Um, do, we need, do we need a harder stronger kind of stick what i mean is that when we when we rely too much on culture i'm sorry um you, you cannot perhaps magically make culture happen on one day it's it's time consuming and it takes time so is it in any chance we need regulations we need law to protect both sides because in terms of data sharing and a lot of getting into my private life, you might need a law of regulation in some countries to perhaps um, make us share the data and perhaps as well protect us from that data to be like used um, wrongful things. So how much do we need those kind of stick, measure, punishment and things else? Really, we, we absolutely do need regulation and legislation and other kind of statutory guidance as well. Um, best will in the world, often some companies will not follow best practice guidance or, uh, you know, self-regulation and so on. So there does need to be very meaningful and very powerful, you know, uh, accountability through tools like legislation um, and regulation as well. But also policymakers have a toolkit available to them um, in this kind of sector. So at one end, you do have the regulation and legislation is a very hard, it's a very uh, direct and very um, uh, defined uh, approach. And the other is your, your kind of best practice, guidance, self-regulation and so on. So it's just trying to understand how those tools fit into um, the role of technology and innovation and, and data as well. No society, I think, has, has really figured this out. Everyone is trying to, to learn, which is why, back to the earlier discussion, it's so important to have policymakers and others really engaging with the realities of the sector, how it's shaping, how it's shifting, uh, keeping pace with technology um, as best that they can, and actually having meaningful discussions internally and with other stakeholders as well about actually how to make this work um, and what is most suitable in the country, whether it is regulation, guidance, or, or other approaches. Okay, I have my finger crossed that um, policy maker hear you because I would rather have a Starting from drafting the law, we're supposed to have half-half, um, policymaker, government side, and then stakeholders, uh, private sector, or even the representative of the people to perhaps um, be careful on what the law said so that it's protect both sides. I, I hope that, that I keep my finger crossed that this, that's going to happen. So talk about that kind of integration, participation, deliberation. Let's move to data a bit because this is also a huge topic that I think a lot of people who access to this webinar is actually want to hear. When we talk data, let me, let me, I'm going to be biased because I'm Thailand, so I'm going to talk about Thailand. Um, in Thailand, we have a lot of problem of who owns the data. Basically, uh, public sector departments, ministries have been constructed and established by their own law. And because of their own law, their own act, that also made them perhaps cage in their own territory of how data would be collected, how data would be used, and basically direct to their function. When you talk about disaster, disaster is cross-function. Disaster is emerging, emerging issue that you need cooperation, collaboration in place. 
And to share data is so difficult for a country that has too much of a siloism and fragmented kind of like public agency work. How, how are we starting this? How should we like, we cannot just keep talking, we're going to create big data and nothing has been done. How exactly is the first good step that perhaps hit hard to the heart of creating big data? That's a really fantastic point. So um, I think the first element is often that kind of um, cross-government working is, is often driven by an external factor. So you mentioned COVID, but other disasters as well uh, really prompt an, an urgent uh, need to kind of break down some of those silos and, and tackle that fragmentation. Sadly, it's, it would be great if this could happen in, in more normal times, but often external um, or unprecedented challenges are what kind of drive change in, in a government setting. Um, the second aspect I think that's really important is actually trying to build some kind of proof of concept or way of demonstrating value um, or explaining that the or highlighting the importance of, of doing this kind of um, desilization or, or defragmentation um, approach. So that could be looking at building a very focused prototype or proof of concept to highlight across government, particularly to policymakers and politicians. This is possible. You know, this is what it can lead to. These are the benefits. Um, you know, it's, it's hard, but actually it is, it is possible in our setting. Um, and then the third is actually very meaningfully engaging with the benefits of this as well. And that often requires very strong leadership and very central leadership from, from the top. So the issue is, as you mentioned, Tavita, is departments often have their own silos, their own fiefdoms. Um, they, are, um, they don't want to share, they don't want to engage with, with some of their peers or, or um, what they see sometimes as competitors. So what you require is a very strong um, leader in that, in that context in, in the government who can actually set a broader strategy and actually has a cross-government mandate to, to drive this progress. And we've seen that work well in places like Estonia, uh, the UK to some extent when the government digital service was set up. Um, that very strong central mandate can be a fantastic role of, um, of transforming government. But the issue then is it's not sustainable. Um, you then need to start building capacity within each of those departments building ideology and building understanding of the potential for this as well. Uh, because one thing I found very powerful in government is the role of inertia. So government can very quickly, not very quickly, but it can run with innovation, but eventually the innovation will be pulled back to the center and the system will kind of recalibrate back to the status quo. So it's all about having leadership that can run with innovation, can embed it and can make it sustainable as well. Okay. Um... I also can, can change the idea uh, with you a bit. I've been working with the Ministry of Public Health a lot lately for the COVID-19, and I do agree with you. The external force, especially when it is a bad scenario, unwanted one, usually drive a change. I, I myself believe I'm, I'm teaching public policy. Usually things that can change behavior is actually bad news. And um, I can see how Ministry of Public Health work in, in, in their own data. They used to have fragmented before. And then they can magically integrate it in two months because of this force that actually make it happen and, and the system is getting better. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to ask one quick question for you and you perhaps giving me 30 seconds of answer so that I can close up our session. Um, since you're in Singapore, right? Yeah. Okay. You've been seeing a lot of practice in Singapore in terms of COVID-19. On top of your head, what would be the most successful kind of like practice or lesson learned or anything at all in terms of managing COVID-19 in Singapore? Is it anything shining up? Yep, so I think the big one is a point we've talked about is strategy and leadership. So the government here is, is very much thinking about what COVID means in society, how they can use tech, innovation and other tools to actually tackle COVID-19, protect the economy and so on but very much keeping that longer term strategic perspective. So looking five, 10, 15 years down the line, um, which I think is very, very impressive and something we don't always see from government. Okay, thank you very much, Kalam. And really nice to have a conversation with you, even though it's like through this online, this is example of digitalization as well. And I enjoyed it very much. We should have like two or three hours of talking. I have a lot of questions to ask you more, but then since I'm running out of time, let me close up this session by thank you to Kalam again. And um, if anyone who is at home or in front of a camera or computer can give him a big round of applause, do so, even though he, ha he can't hear it. Um, let me close up this session by saying this. When we talk about digitalization, innovation, government tech, 
it's easy to talk technology. It's also easy to put technology, any application and fantastic words into those public transactions, public service, and even make our data up there on a map or even in a table and then tell us that, oh, this is fabulous. I do agree. However, don't forget that any digitalization that's going to be really useful, effective, and efficient in any country, it also requires institutional change. Law, legislations, practice, skill, management, human resource, and most of all, trust among the people and the government. And that would create a culture of a quality of digitalization to our future city and future country and perhaps future world. Thank you very much and let's say goodbye to you guys on the Zoom and every webinar and everything and also to you, Kalam. Hope to be able to talk to you again in the future. Thank you very much. Sawadee Thank you very much to our moderator, Ajahn Tawida of Thammasa University and also many thanks to Mr. Callum Hanforth from the UNDP and that was a take on government tech for disaster risk management. เอาล่ะค่ะในช่วงหน้าเนี่ยนะคะก็จะเป็นหัวข้อสุดท้ายแล้วนะคะว่าด้วยเรื่องของเทคโนโลยีที่จะช่วยปกป้องดูแลสุ